at what you're fishing for. This isn't the white whale. This isn't Moby Dick. It is something, however, that describes, to my mind, a, a dinosaur's pursuit. They're called Patagonian toothfish. Uh, we know them now as Chilean sea bass when they're served, and Matt assures me that you pay extra price for them. But the, what you describe, Matt, is an undersea monster what, with an overbite, an extremely aggressive fish. Um, and it can weigh up to a hundred kilos. And so what we're, we're looking at fishing deep. Is that, that's the important thing. You have to put your lines down very deep. We are. Uh, we're fishing, yeah, uh, 800 meters, sometimes a mile deep. But I'm a little bit worried, John, that if I describe the fish that we're going to put them off Chile, your, your listeners off. No, the, you uh, put Chile me off. Uh, so give people a chance. You, you, you poetically said an abyssal cruise missile. So with a, t- with a toothy grin and, uh, we're talking about a predator, right? This eats they other... It eats everything. Impressive predators. Uh, two meters of muscle and torpedo shape with a big mouthful of teeth at the front and just built for sudden bursts of speed just to, to grab a, a squid or a, a smaller toothfish or any other small anim- animal smaller than itself that goes too close. And you want to catch 100 tons of these yes of course and we're going to dis- and the way you do that is you put a line over that sinks very low because it turns out patagonian toothfish have a sweet tooth for sardines they can't they can't resist is that it they do the odor the, the oil that makes sardines so famous and flavorsome uh, drifts across the ocean currents and uh, that is irresistible to toothfish so booty our fishing master had chosen sardines and uh, we were putting 14,000 hooks laced with 14,000 sardines into the water every day. There are two kinds of lines. There's the big line that goes down and sinks, and then attached to that are fishing lines. And what I what I want to understand, does some individual put a sardine on every one of those 15,000 hooks as the line goes down? That happens every day, and on some boats that could be happening twice a day. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? Fifteen, 15 thousand hooks with what? And one and, oh, and a human being is putting it on by hand. There's no machine to do this, so you have a lot of labor on board that spends a lot of time doing repetitive work. Is that correct? We had a team of what are called pot makers, and they would uh, collect the line as it came on, and they would neatly coil the the line, the rope, and each uh, nylon monofilament line into a, a a big plastic basket, and they would arrange them throughout the day. So that at night, when we put the line back into the water, 14,000 hooks would peel into the water at at six knots, so a little over six miles an hour, and they just fly through the air. And each one was baited with a with a sardine, straight through the eyes, hook passed through the eyes. A detail here: the factory where um, Matt spends his time when we come to the crisis. The factory is not the bottom of the ship, not the, but the second level up. And it has a door that opens out that's very close to the sea itself. How high would you say that door was, Matt? Well, the factory deck itself was pretty much on the waterline, so at sea level. And the, the storm door, the sea door that gave us access to a winch outside, that was just maybe only a foot above sea level a lot of the time. And through that door, you could actually walk out through a hole in the side of the hull onto a little balcony and cut into the side of the boat. And that was to be our undoing later on. But basically that meant that we could get outside to haul with the winch the, the line back onto the boat and bring all those fish back into the, into the factory to be processed. The book is Last Man Out. Now that we've set the fishing, we're going to go to the tragedy itself, a true story of disaster and survival on the Antarctic seas. Matt Lewis is the author. I'm John Batchelor.